Thank you to Angela for that great message. I know she couldn't be here, but I just really thought she hit so many of the points. You know, keep, we are a culture that often keeps our heads down. We need to, we have the courage to step up and speak up and we're changing the narrative, um, shattering the bamboo ceiling. On that note, I would like to invite um, the, mem the members of our first panel to make your way up here to the stage. And speaking of shattering that bamboo ceiling, our first panel is Strategies to Increase Asian American Representation in the C-Suite in the Boardroom. And I don't know if there are gonna be photos of up here, so if you just sit in a specific spot. Oh, if you could sit um, lined up with your, oh, perfect, amazing. Like, how did you do that? Yeah, how did you know? <laughs> Completely Maybe somebody has guessed. Somebody has probably guided them. I don't know. That was that was amazing. Um, yes. Okay. So we're talking about strategies to increase Asian American representation in the C-suite and in the boardroom. And um, like I said before, it's a topic that's been on like every conference. So I can't wait till it's not. But um, it is my honor to introduce the moderator of this panel, Krishnan Rajagopalani. I think I might be saying that. Rajagopalan. Rajagopalan, yes. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. The president and CEO of Hydric and Struggles. Um, it's a global leadership advisory firm providing executive search leadership assessment and development, which Anne spoke about as well. He serves as the board of directors. Um, he serves on the board of directors of Hydric and Struggles and leads the firm's global management committee. So thank you so much. We could not ask for a better moderator for this panel. And I'll let you take it away. Super. Thank you. So uh, we're pretty good at following rules, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is uh, great to be here uh, with you all uh, and in person. I mean, I'll tell you, this is my first event outside of Washington. I live in Washington, D.C., where I'm with a, a large group, and it's just exciting uh, to see everyone. So thank you for coming uh, as well. Thank you to John uh, and the team here at uh, AA. Uh, BDC as well for organizing this and bringing everybody together. I'm honored to be joined on the stage here by uh, Jeannie Diefenderfer, uh, Ida Liu, and Michael Chen as well. And uh, it, it's kind of, uh, this panel really brings a lot, I think, in terms of this conversation. We want it to be a very practical conversation. Uh, these topics often uh, end up floating up pretty high and people don't walk out of here with uh, with practical thoughts, so we're gonna to try to, to push to that as well. Just some quick introductions. Uh, Jeannie is a CEO of the Center for Higher Ambition Leadership, okay? And uh, let me try this out here a little bit to say what it's about uh, <laughs> and see if I get it right. I, this is an organization that's about bringing together leaders with, you know, and it's sort of been there a little bit in advance of trying to not only get superior economic returns, but do good as well at the same time, and how do we do that? So, so thinking about value and purpose uh, at the same time, uh, that's what it's about. But uh, uh, Jeannie uh, has a fantastic uh, career uh, in the past as well. She was an executive at Verizon uh, in the past. Uh, she has served uh, on numerous public and private boards as well and brings a lot of experience to us. Uh, so great to have you with us. Uh, Ida has a very storied career at City. Uh, you know, uh, as I got to know her background, uh, it's banking and finance on one hand, and it's fashion. And I thought these two things don't relate, but she somehow, you know, took those and brought them together at City and launched a business all about fashion, all about retail, and, and now in her role, she's the global head of the city's private bank, okay? Uh, that's amazing, and uh, she's on their leadership team. Uh, she started up their Asian American client group. She sits on their uh, city's women's steering group as well. And, and of note, uh, Ida's one of the few that is, that is known for speaking to her Chinese identity as well, and how it has contributed to her journey uh, at this intersection as well. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about that. And then Michael um, is a general partner and CEO of Chen & Associates. Uh, it's an advisory firm, and it focuses on multiple industries. Again, a broad range, uh, financial services, media, aviation, um, 
And Michael uh, was previously uh, affiliated with either as an advisor or actually on the management teams of a huge range of firms, Bridgewater, uh, NBC Universal. I think you were an officer at GE, and he was at IBM as well. So he brings much to this table. He's also served on public and private boards as well. Uh, so I think we'll have a, a great conversation. Welcome. Okay. So before we get started, let me just put some context to it. I think you've you've heard this, but let me just set the stage uh, a little bit. Look, there has been a lot of progress that's been made in diverse representation and leadership roles, uh, but there's a lot more to do, and uh, I think we'll continue uh, to remind ourselves that this is a journey uh, that we're on. But here's the problem statement, really, at the end of the day still uh, on this journey. Uh, I think approximately 27% of professionals uh, in U.S. companies are, are Asian American, okay? And so if we then start looking at that and saying, okay, what happens over time here, you know, and we start looking at leadership. And if we look at, you know, Fortune 500 and we look at S&P 500 companies and we look at managerial and executive positions there, wow, that number drops to less than 6%, okay, 5% or so. And if we actually looked at who are corporate officers in those uh, companies, it might drop to about 1% or 2%. Okay, so what's happening? Okay, what's happening with this pipeline? What's happening with development? Uh, and as Ann mentioned, this occurs uh, at the board level as well. Um, our research, our board monitor report shows that about 9% of new appointments now are Asian American directors as well. So, um, and look, that doesn't mean diversity isn't being represented, and we'll talk a little bit about this. The actual diversity numbers last couple of years have been going through the roof, but, um, l l you know, what about Asian Americans is the conversation we're having here. So this eliminates the need for boards to have a much wider aperture, I think, when it comes to making decisions and leadership teams as well. So we want to spend some time, again, focused on the experiences of uh, this esteemed panel over here and learn from them. Uh, and they're gonna try to give you some practical advice as well as you navigate your careers, okay? So with that, uh, let me just uh, kick it over. And Michael, maybe I, I, can, I can ask you uh, to comment on and have each of you comment on this as well. What strategies have worked for you as an Asian American in advancing your career? Uh, that's great, great question. You know, I feel like I've had a blessed career over the last 25, 30 years. And I look back on it and I said, what are the things that I was able to do to overcome some of the obstacles of, of the stereotype of Asian Americans, right? Asian Americans are perceived to be you know, smart, hardworking, uh, loyal team players, right? But the perception is, let's, let's be candid. And one of the things I have to be is always candid is, the perception is we don't take risks, we don't communicate well, we don't speak up, we're not leaders and we don't know how to motivate people. So if we know that, let's say you know that that's a stereotype, all right? How do you overcome it? You can't ignore it, right? You have to realize that is what it is. So what I says, okay, well, I'm not really that smart, right? But if they think I'm smart, <laughs> I'll let them think that, right? So I won't spend a lot of time focusing on proving them how smart I am, right? Or what a team player I am, you know, that's a given. So I spent a lot of my career focusing on, on changing the perception that I didn't know how to communicate, that I didn't know how to lead, that I didn't know how to go into sales and, and sell. So I spent most of my career really focusing on changing that perception. So I spent a lot of my time in the career in sales, really spending time getting to know the people, the clients, internal clients, external clients, and getting them to know that, wow, Michael Chen can actually communicate and actually can lead and can persuade other people of new ideas. So I think the two things I would take out of it, and, and we can talk more later, but really creating a personal brand that's different than the perception of the stereotype of Asian Americans. So I create a brand that, you know, yes, I have integrity and I can be trustworthy and I deliver results. Because you have to deliver results, right? That's, that's the first thing, having integrity and, and being reliable. But the second thing is that you also make an impact in everything you do, right? That's the, that's the second eye. The third eye I call is being inclusive, being able to include people in journey. That we're not just introverts behind our computer and doing our own work, that we include people in the discussion. And the fourth eye is really inspiring people. So really creating that personal brand and then really being able to communicate. Because at the end of the day, if you can't communicate what you're doing and you can't communicate and recognize the success of your teammates and motivate them, then to be honest, you can't be a leader. So 
I really would say the one game changer I have is I was always not afraid to speak up. Okay. I was always willing to raise my hand. <laughs> you know, all of us are, are smart and we take good notes in class, but if you don't raise your hand and ask a question, or in a meeting, even if you understand everything, if you don't raise that, your hand and give your point of, of opinion across, you won't get noticed. So I would say the biggest thing I learned over 30 years is always speak up, mm. always add value to the conversation, and always communicate in a good way. And the last thing I'll say on communications, there's a lot of people out there that are great communicators that are gonna try to shut you down. <laughs> and they're gonna cut you off. And we even saw that in the presidential candidate with Andrew Yang, a lot of people would cut him off. You have to learn how to fight for your right to speak up and speak your time. Don't just take a back seat. Don't be a wallflower to anybody in business because mm -hmm. we are all good enough to be leaders and it's time for us, especially this year, to show how great leaders we can be. Super, thank you so much. <laughs> Ida, would you, care to, would you care to amplify or add to that? I, I would love to and that was so well said, yeah. Michael. Uh, firstly, I just want to thank John Wong for 20 years of AABDC and providing this platform for all of us, John. So thank you very much for the great work of this organization. It's a pleasure to be involved. So, you know, I am sitting at a very, very unique vantage point. So I've been facing two different types of ceilings. I've got the glass ceiling over here and the bamboo ceiling over there. On the glass ceiling front, we've actually made a lot of progress. Chipping away, I'm seeing some cracks in the glass ceiling. But on the bamboo ceiling, not at all, not at all. So why is that? You know, we've been so focused in my 20 plus years in financial services on gender equity, and we've made a lot of progress on gender equity, and over the last five, 10 years, more so on inclusivity and diversity uh, amongst the group, but interestingly less so, frankly, on the Asian community. And I'm speaking very bluntly here because there is that model minority myth, right? There are those biases that we do well, we work hard, we put our head down, all the things that Michael said that actually in our cultural upbringing directly conflict with being successful in corporate America. So what does that mean? It's being the single achiever versus teamwork, right? Which is important in corporate America. It's being modest versus speaking up, having a voice and touting your accomplishments. You know, so it's that mindset shift of the cultural values, the way that we were raised to be quiet, to be humble, to work hard, to achieve solo uh, performance versus what you need to do in corporate America, which is embrace partnership, teamwork. We succeed as a team, not on our own. And the ability to speak up for what you want and make sure that you tout your accomplishments. That's something that's very hard for a lot of us, right? Because we're, we're modest, we're humble. We don't wanna look like or feel like we're bragging or boasting. But the truth is if you don't tout your accomplishments, don't expect your managers to know what you're doing, what you're contributing. And as Michael said, if you don't ask, you're not gonna get it. So it's very important that we have that voice at the table, that we challenge the status quo, that we modify the approach a little bit and recognize that you know, there's, it's not a one size fits all, but we've gotta be aware of some of the obstacles that we are inherently facing as we're looking to progress in corporate America. Um, I, I wanna be additive here. Um, so my experience so mirrors everything Michael and Ida has said. And so it's uh, communications and being articulate and, um, and all that great stuff. So that, that has been sort of my experience. One thing I would add is that, uh, and to the point Ida you made, right? Because we are so heavily invested in meritocracy that we, we work hard because there is sort of that result of working hard. We have a hard time asking for help. And in the majority, when people ask for help, it's considered to be really good, right? Looking for mentors and sponsors, asking for advice and counsel. That kind of goes to the collaboration. You want to be part of a team. It's all good thing. Um, we culturally have a hard time asking for help. One, because it just doesn't feel like you're, you must not be good enough if you're asking for help. So that's very hard. So that's a huge lift, I think, for us to sort of get that out of our mind. But also defining it in a way 
that asking for help for us, it's very similar to getting all of the great experience from people around us who are really wanting to help us succeed and recognizing when that's present. And it doesn't mean that you're giving in to the notion and the conditioning of, oh, you must not be good enough if you're looking for help, but rather that you want to be better and you want to understand and self-reflect on what you can do better to be an excellent leader uh, in every sense, right? Not just for APIs. And it's perfectly okay and actually acceptable and inspiring to ask for that kind of help. I found that when I ask for help, my experience is that I also, it gives me confidence to actually offer help. And it has really helped me to develop my muscle around paying it forward and really learning that art of coaching and mentoring because I got such great coaching and mentoring over my career to actually offer it to everyone else that I have the opportunity to serve. So that's been really, really helpful as well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll, ju I'll just add a, a teaser thought in there that uh, sort of, when I think about it from my perspective as well, sort of the balancing, uh, uh, sort of being accepted with embracing your difference. Uh, I think that uh, that's a really important thing to, to acknowledge and to remember. I mean, I've always, you know, it wasn't hard to tell myself I don't look like a white person. So, <laughs> you know, so you have to acknowledge who you are and, and what you bring as well. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Uh, let's, I think you referenced a few challenges along the way. And I'd love to kind of double click on challenges that you face. But also, if we look ahead uh, to tomorrow, are there different sets of challenges you see people are going to face, uh, you know, uh, as Asian Americans? And, and, and how do you see that? Um, Jeannie, do you want to take Yeah, so to me, you know, all the numbers that we hear, right, yeah. in terms of the improvements we made, um, but also yet not, right? Um, I find we're at this incredible juncture of time when people like me, who were like immigrated in 1974 and I'm 60 and I've, I've sort of survived through all those years of, you know, pet down, working hard, but also looking up and trying to do all the right things. And when I look up, there's like nobody who looks like me, right? Um, here we are. And we work really hard to make sure that for the generations coming behind us, there are people like me who've actually been successful, like Michael and Ida and Krishnan, who look like us. And that gives us um, confidence to go forward. But I do think that the method by which we get to where we need to go are changing. So the younger generation, I talk to my daughter who's 26 all the time about this, right? Um, so they enter the workforce with a very, very different expectation than I did. So, so there are some basic, fundamental baseline mm -hmm. expectations that she and her colleagues and, uh, and my, that generation has um, about how they are, about how they operate. So the fact that there is a glass ceiling or a bamboo ceiling, it is honestly insulting to that generation because they don't come with that expectation of, oh, we're less than, right? In fact, many of them will enter thinking we're more than. Right? And you're going to like put me down, and I'm not going to deal with that, right? Also, they're fighters very differently than I was. Um, because, again, part of it is I think our generation did our job right. to make sure that they were not going to have those barriers. I certainly did. Even if it wasn't direct, I'm sure it kind of seeped into her DNA, right, as she was growing up. So she, they have this incredible high bar, which I have to tell you, I am so impressed with. Yep. So I think going forward, one of the work we have to do is make sure that we measure the next generation with a different bar. That we do not continue to measure them based on what we live through. So let them sort of reach higher heights in terms of having a higher bar and reaching even the beyond what we dream of right, and not stifle them. And the second thing is, those of us who have arrived in some way, right, to our points of success and position of influence and power, 
not be afraid to use it and actually carve the path and actually take some bullets, you know, be out there and take, take those arrows and stuff and uh, make sure that the next generation can really thrive and meet their potential. That's what I would say. Thank you. Care to add to that? <laughs> so look, I, I'm gonna go back to what Anne said at the very beginning of this conversation, and that is seeing is believing. And right now, we don't have a lot to look up to. When you look at the percentage of Asian CEOs on Fortune 500 companies, I can count them on a single digit you know, percentage uh, perspective, Krishnan. So, I think we're all aware that yes, we would love this next generation that has a lot of energy optimism, which is fantastic. And I look at the next generation of Asian leaders, many of who are sitting here from my team uh, today, and I couldn't be more proud right. of this next generation of leaders. But we all still have a lot of work to do to increase the representation so that they can look up and say it's possible and it's doable. So what are the actions that all of us are gonna to take to contribute to this, right? So we believe that what gets measured gets done. And so when every single leader across our institution has metrics and goals whereby they're measured on their progress, it does make a difference. So we do think uh, that it is important to do that. We also think that it is important to understand where the bottlenecks are, where the frustrations are, where the challenges are for the next generation of Asian leaders to get to the top. So we have Asian heritage networks, we have training uh, development programs for our next generation of Asian leaders to make sure that we arm them with this knowledge base of everything that we're sharing today, but how do you do it? How do you get past that bottleneck? Because we have plenty, and, and Christian knows the numbers better than, than any of us, but we have plenty of Asian representation in the mid-level, in the middle. But we've got to break through that bamboo ceiling and get to the top. So we have more representation, a louder voice, and seeing is truly believing. I, I'd just like to add it from a different perspective. Many of you are out there probably in the middle of your career uh, and saying, how do I get promoted to the next level, right? What do I need to do? What is different? So when I was at, at, at that level you know, years ago, um, all you needed was like, you had five people put a resume in, you just have to have a good resume, have your, your previous boss give you a good recommendation, and do great on an interview. I'm like, okay, that's how you get the next job. Today, it's, it's a lot different, I would say, for you. And I feel sorry for a lot of you, because you know, when you apply for a job, there's like 500 resumes. You could have a great resume, you could interview well, your boss could recommend you well, but there's 500 resumes. Like, how do you sort through it? And so what I really think is more important today than ever is creating a personal brand. Mm. You know, when I was uh, you know, working hard back you know, 10, 15 years ago, I don't work as hard today, but, I, you know, I, <laughs> but I was, when I was traveling all the time and all that, you know, you could go home and have your personal life be separate from your, yeah. your work life. You can't today anymore, right? In order to be successful and really rise to the top, your whole personal brand is reflected in your resume. Someone can Google you now, right? And you want them to Google you, right? You don't want them to just see your resume and Google you, you're not out there if you're looking for a senior level job. And the way to be out there as a personal brand, you gotta do more than just your work. You gotta be out there helping out your community, you know, doing nonprofits, right? You have to be out there in your local community, maybe uh, join your local board. If people were saying, well, I want someone that can really give a good speech, right? They don't know if you can give a good speech. You might not even get to the interview table. Have, give speeches at conferences. Have it being videotaped, right? Have a persona where someone can Google you and say, wow, this person did this, spoke at this conference, helped out with nonprofit, and it was in the media, don't give me an interview. So find a way to be more than just your work. Find a way to have a personal brand out of work because people want well-rounded people. And I would just say that's the thing that's changing today is you just can't leave work at home. You're, you're 24 seven is your personal brand. If you really want to make it a top, you have to be out there more than just at work. So, thank you. <clears throat> so, if we think about this group in the middle and when we think mm. about development, mm. so, you know, whose responsibility is it to advocate, to de help these individuals develop? And I'll ask a very poignant question since we're all in these roles, I mean, 
is it comfortable to be advocating for other Asian Americans? Is it not? Uh, you know, uh, well, what is the responsibility that leaders have uh, on that dimension? And then we'll maybe double click from there to sponsorship and mentorship and what you see on that dimension as well. Um, I don't really maybe ask you to, to comment on that. I feel, I feel very privileged um, to be in the position that I am today, doing something that I love with a group of extraordinary people with wonderful clients. So because I am in a privileged position of doing something that I love, I want to make sure that we are advocating and increasing the representation and allowing more opportunities and visibility for our Asian colleagues around the world. And I can tell you that I've been extraordinarily vocal. You have a seat at the table for a reason. You've got to use that seat at the table to pound the table and make sure that you get as much representation as possible. You know, I'm, I'm so pleased. I, I, as I said, I have, I'm staring at a, a lot of my wonderful colleagues. It's the first time I'm seeing everybody. This is my first in-person event in 18 months. Right. But this is, I'm here because I believe in the cause and I believe in, in this mission. And, and, I, and I know that we all have a role to play and a part to play here. So, Christian, it is absolutely a priority of mine. I'm super hyper-focused on it. And then you asked the second question about mentors. Uh, for me, mentorship is something that is so incredibly important, and we have to think about mentorship in multi-dimensions. It's not just about having a senior mentor in your business. It's about having senior mentors, peer mentors, junior mentors, so you have that multi-dimensionality of views. In fact, it is some of the juniors on my team that provide us with the best and most interesting, out-of-the-box, innovative ideas. So having that uh, viewpoint is incredibly important. I would also suggest that when you think about mentorship, that you don't just think about it within your business or within your uh, industry, but rather try to get a broader viewpoint. Because it's really interesting how different the perspectives can be uh, someone outside of finance and healthcare, other businesses, giving me a purview on the way that they're doing things. And we can all learn from one another. So I think the diversity of thought, perspectives, in the way that you shape your mentorship uh, is very, very important and very additive. Thank you so much for that. Je Jeannie, any thoughts on that? So um, ultimately, I think, in my view, it is your responsibility to make sure that you define success in the way that you believe in. It's hard in a system where success is defined on your behalf, but at the end of the day, it's really important to reflect on does it fit with you as a human and making sure that you're aligned with that and frankly, pivoting it as necessary. You need to, to the brand, a comment that Michael made, even though it is your primary responsibility for your own career and how you define success to move forward, you also need to create a community, a, a village of supporters to help you get there. That's where all these other pieces come in, including your employer, the big entity, right, that has programs or training development um, initiatives or uh, fast tracker um, programs that you want to be part of. So if you don't know how to go about to get those things, this is where you trigger your village of supporters to get that kind of one insight as to what about me on these things, get some um, input and feedback as to what are the things that I, I could use some more development as I go forward in terms of what am I good at? What could I do more to get better at? And if I wanna have this career trajectory, what are the kind of things I need to fill in the gaps? Where do I need to get that help? And how do I develop that overall journey, right? So this is where, to me, that's very, very hard to do on your own. You need a group of folks who've been around you, who knows you, as well as who understand the system to help you craft that personal brand development, leadership development journey to move forward. And when you know how to sort of click when necessary to put it together, I think the path will come alive. And also, 
don't, um, don't be apologetic when you need to shift. We're humans. You know, we change, we grow, we get married, we have kids. Oh, gosh, when you have kids, the whole world changes, right? Uh, no matter whether you're dad, mom, or anything. So it's just give, your per give yourself permission to be nimble and flexible and develop the necessary muscles that comes along as you grow into who you are. Uh I'll give you a personal experience. Um, I love the words pay it forward. It's one of my favorite movies. It's amazing how when you pay it forward, how much more it comes back to you. And I'll give you my personal story about that. The first 10, 15 years of my career, I just want to do whatever I can to succeed and become a CEO. And I started taking all these jobs, trying to get promoted quickly. And I became the jack of all trades and the master of none. So one day I decided, like, I'm going to do what I want to do and just have fun and go into sales. When I went into sales, I started helping out airline CEOs. I was financing aircraft airlines. And I got to meet them and gave them advice and started just helping them out about the business and the industry. And all of a sudden, these airline CEOs and CFOs started like giving me business because I was helping them for free, giving them advice on the industry. And a lot of the CEOs are very lonely people in the industry. They don't have anyone to give them advice. So I became their board of directors, their mentors, their sponsors to support them in giving them knowledge. And also at the same time at GE, we created this Asian American Pacific Forum, APAF, it's called Asian Pacific American Forum, where I was asked to kind of help, help mentor other Asian Americans. And when I started doing that, is when my career really started taking off. Like I was able to use that as a platform to give speeches, to kind of lead the Asian American group to practice my ability to speak in front of big audiences, to practice my ability to get people to go to events, to lead, to inspire other people. And what's amazing is that the Chairman G noticed me through those two things. They noticed me through my uh, helping out the other Asian Pacific Americans, and he noticed me because the CEO of the airlines actually run the same circle as the Chairman G and started telling them about me, about how I was able to help them for free, about giving back. And what I realized in life is that really, and, and part of it is I'm a person of faith, that the more you give, the more you'll give back. And I'll, I'll give you one practical example you can do. Take the time to write five thank you notes a week to people that have helped you. If you write five thank you notes a week to people that help you, that's about 250 thank you notes you write. What do you think happens when the person receives a thank you note for you, from you? What do you think happens? there's a very good chance that person will start thinking about you and saying, what a good thing this person did. There's a good chance that person will write you back or email you back. There's a good chance you'll build a better relationship with that person. But please don't write five thank you notes to the same person every week. You know, you're driving them crazy, right? <laughs> then they'll think you're kind of like uh, psychopathic. But, but if you take the time to thank others and recognize others and reach out to others and help others, it will come back to you. So I would just say the whole thing about do it not only for helping other Asian Americans, but it's amazing how much it will help you in both your life and your career if you do that. You know, Michael, you, you mentioned one thing that you've taken advantage of here as a platform and sort of a broader organizational entity that existed over there as well. And Ida, I'm going to come to you with this question. I mean, you referenced a few things that you're doing that you think are making a difference and maybe it'd be great things for people to hear and try to take back to their organizations and maybe craft programs that look like that. Could you just amplify on that a little I, bit? I would be delighted to. And I just wanted to say, Michael, I couldn't agree more on that. Uh, my team is here, so a lot of them know, and I say this all the time, we have a lot of IQ in our business. In a client-facing business, we have a lot of EQ. But the most important thing to me is the DQ, and that's how we show decency quotient, how we show appreciation for one another, teamwork, and uh, you know that acknowledgement. So uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, at City, uh, we have different uh, diversity networks. So we have an Asian Heritage Network, which I've uh, been a part of the steering committee on. And that's where we, we look at what's happening with Asian representation across the firm. Uh, we look at where the bottlenecks are. And we've seen that Asians are very well represented up until the mid-level. 
Okay, but then breaking through that mid-level to the senior level is where we need a little bit more support. So we brought in expert speakers, we have mentorship programs, we have learning and development programs to help, again, just awareness, training, um, to get to that next step. I also have a team within the private bank, a diversity committee, uh, led by Denise, who's sitting here, um, and she uh, helps us at the private bank foster all different kinds of awareness, brings in outside speakers, talks about ways that we can be more inclusive. And I don't think it's a surprise to anybody in this room how challenging it's been for the Asian community over the last 18 months through the COVID pandemic. The unconscious bias has become conscious bias, and it is heartbreaking and gut-wrenching to see some of the violence and the discriminatory acts that have been happening against the community over the last year plus. And so we have brought the groups together to talk about it, right? Because we think it's really important to have an outlet, a, a way to express different concerns and views. And that's helped us as a leadership team shape the way that we're supporting our community through very, very challenging times. So that's just a few different things that we've done at City. Thank you for offering those ideas to everyone as well. Appreciate it. Okay, let's, um, I was at, uh, a dinner last night uh, with many of uh, uh, the awardees and uh, almost everybody sort of said, oh, I'd love to get on a board, okay? I think, so I wanna just click to that topic here a little bit and you know, we've been talking about the C-suite, let's talk a little bit about boards and Jeannie, you're sitting on a few boards as well. So how is diversity different in a board? I mean, and, and, and a broader question, is it a zero sum game? I mean, like the board just say, hey, now we're diverse, so adding one more, adding an Asian American, I mean, why would I do that? Right. I've hit my number, right? right. right. Is it a zero-sum game? It's so, so annoying, it surely is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and uh, you know, this is when you have to kind of, you have to put that aside and get out there and do the work, to Ida's point. So it's funny, I got my first board through exactly like Michael said, where um, because of all the work that I did at Verizon as an executive and I was a chief procurement officer and took the company through two mergers, you obviously have a lot of relationship with suppliers, lots of CEOs, right? Who only thing they see me when they see my face is a big dollar sign. Um, I say, oh, can I, can I be part of that? Um, and my nature is also to help. So I helped a lot of um, medium and small sized businesses who could not get into my door because I was buying you know, $2 billion, $22 billion worth of goods, right? So my tendency is to one, help innovators keep innovating and turn that to utilize in my big business to make sure that we kept the big vendors honest um, and bring some, infuse some innovation into my business. So through that, I mentor a lot of CEOs who are small and medium sized businesses. And when I retired from Verizon, um, it was one of the first phone calls I got is, and I, I, I didn't really expect it. They said, you know, you've done so much for me as a person, as a CEO, and for my business. Um, and one of my biggest priority as a chief procurement officer was increasing diversity spend. So uh, it was imperative to me that I leverage my position and power to do better. And I knew as, a, as number one, number two company in the telecom industry, me and AT&T, you know, we were probably buying 60% of the goods in our industry, and it was very critical that I had a position on it. And I convinced my counterpart in AT&T at the time to do this together, and uh, we, we actually literally increased diversity spend between us and our primary suppliers, I'm talking Cisco's of the world, right, uh, Juniper's of the big, big players, to commit to uh, what we call the billion dollar round table. And, that's when you start to see things happen. And when, I, when, when the person called me to say, I want to introduce you to a CEO because that CEO is looking for a board member who comes from the uh, background and your experience, I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, I wasn't looking for a board seat, but eventually I was going to contemplate getting on a board seat. So this is really it's, it's sort of interesting to me. So that's how I got on my first board. So when I look around, so we know in addition to the numbers that Krishna stated, when you look at as of fall of last year, 2020, 4.4% of AAPIs occupy Fortune 1000 boards. So on average, right, if you say they're on average, 10 board members, that's like less than one, yeah? 
<laughs> per company. So, the, so we, you know, the Ascent Pinnacle, which I'm a, I'm a lead ex executive advisor to, basically said, you know, we're going to make that number to be 10% in 2025. And uh, we had lots of conversation with people who have interest in this area, including um, Krishnan and, and Anne and others. It, it's a big stretch. So um, half the people I talked to said, you're crazy. That, that, that number is like ridiculous. You're not going to go from 4.4 to 10% in four years, basically four proxy season cycles, right? And the other half said, that's not enough. That's when I knew it was the right number, <laughs> right? because you have the opposite sort of people saying it's not good enough. What I, what I say to my board when we talk about diversity, um, and I've certainly chaired enough NAMGAV committees on boards, because I'm usually the only one that look like me, right? Um, so when I introduce other Asian American candidates, so the, I know what they're thinking, right? You know, but you're there, and we have one already. All right, um, but we need like the others, right? Um, so what I usually talk about is let's not make the assumption that the incumbents are the ones who should be here if you were to start from scratch. So take away all the other variables and say, if you do the right job as a board and you do the skills and background matrix, as we look forward as a company for 10 years, what are the skills and backgrounds we need? And inevitably, all of the forces of industry and boards and investment investors, institutional investors are very vocal right now about ESG, environmental, social, and governance focus. So it is one thing they wanna hear from every NAMGOV chair and the board chair about what are you doing in that area? How are you mirroring your customers? Not only in C-suites, and, and, but on the board. What do you look like? And we know the answer to that, not well. So utilizing those forces to say, rather than saying, let's get one of this and one of that and one of that, which is so insulting, to be honest, but to say, what are the attributes that you need as a board? And having the courage to say, Let's get them and be mindful of the right candidate pool. You gotta be in the pool. I'm gonna go back to the NFL Rooney rule, right? If you don't have the pool of diverse candidates that you interview from, you're not gonna land a diverse candidate. So I made it my mission to say, at a minimum, you have to have a diverse pool. So it, and it takes time, it's not a one-time thing, right? Because remember, proxy season comes only once a year. And uh, trying to refresh boards, as Krishna Nan knows, is not an easy feat. So you, you just have to be persistent, insistent, and also consistent in your values and criteria to move forward. And honestly, um, you have to also be willing to have some debates and sometimes confrontational discussions, <laughs> which can be done with um, the right way. This is not about fighting and yelling, because a board is really important to have a collegial and good chemistry as a fit, as a group of people. But really working the relationship piece with every board member, particularly with CHRO and the CEO, to do the right um, plan and executing and frankly, not, being, not resting at the laurels when you get one minority candidate on board, right? Oh, thank God we got one in, or we got one woman, we got one person of color, we can rest for a few years. No, no, no. <laughs> you gotta keep at it and you gotta keep going. So people who look like me um, has to step up. And I, I always found it to be my obligation and duty to the paying it forward comment as well as because I can. I am in a position of influence. I have earned my right and my reputation through my 30 years of accomplishments to actually influence and not be apologetic about influencing to have a different outcome. Thank you. We're between you and break, but having said that, I do want to close this by going around the horn and just asking for Again, one bit of personal advice. Uh, if you were to just kind of uh, think about our audience here, think about you know 
yourself many years ago, and what would you give from a career planning advice for them to advance in their careers? Uh, Michael, I'll just, we'll just go right around. Sure, sure. I'll just kind of uh, segue into the closing with the comment about boards. If, if you really want to join a board, think about why you want to join the board. Is it just a resume builder? Think about, are you joining a board for the right reason? I, I wanted to be a CEO for the wrong reason, right? And I realized that because once you became a CEO, all of a sudden, like all the stress of quarterly earnings, making the numbers, all the legal issues, the HR issues, like I'm dealing, oh my goodness, I like building relationships with clients and I'm dealing with all this you know, accounting and, and legal and financial and HR stuff. So now my company is, uh, advises CEOs on how to build their business. I like that a lot better, you know? <laughs> I can help think strategic and big and, and not have to deal with the quarterly earnings and all that. Uh, but so think about as you join a board, see why you want to join it, what are you adding value to the board? What is it so you want to join a board, but what is the board going to get out of you, right? And the key thing about uh, doing anything is speak up. If you want to join a board, if you want to get a promotion, you need to speak up, and you need to build a resume. There is probably no chance of you joining a public board if you never joined a, a, some other board before. So join your nonprofit board. Help out your community. Join your local United Way or your local uh, town government. Join a nonprofit board first. Join a smaller board first. Learn how it works. Learn how it's effective. And also, find a way to build your brand. You know, one of the things I've always encouraged is more Asian Americans on, on board seats. But then my wife called me out as my strategic advisor and says, well, why haven't you really taken a leadership role in, in joining more boards? And this was just last year when there were all the Asian Americans in the pandemic. And I thought about it. I was like, well, you know, that's a good point. I probably should try to get more active in boards, not because as a career builder, but because I want to be visible for other Asian Americans, and Asian Americans can be good on boards. So what I thought about, okay, I got to you know, get much more active and take leadership roles in the boards I'm on, become a chairman of a board, vice chair on the board, take leadership roles, join the audit committee, so I can show that I have done this when I join bigger boards. And also, a colleague of mine says, well, Financial Times is, is you know, you know, going to name the top 100 diverse leaders for boards. And my wife said, you should just put your name in the hat. And I did. And it was a grueling three, four months. They interviewed me. They checked my LinkedIn. They Googled <laughs> me. They called me like six times. But at the end of the day, it was worth it, because then I was one, named one of the top 100 on Financial Times. Yeah. yeah. But so my summary is, if you want something, go get it. Don't let the fact that you're Asian Americans or other people think you're not good enough, stop you, you know? Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Just speak up, do it, be proactive. Our Asian culture has told us to, you know, suffer in silence, right? Do not <laughs> suffer in silence anymore. It is time for us to raise. If someone pushes you, push back, okay? This is time for us to, as Asian Americans, help one another and be proud to be Americans, be, be proud of our Asian heritage as well. Thank you. And I, I, I view uh, being an Asian American as a competitive advantage. I really do. Um, it is an extraordinary position for all of us in this room to be in. Uh, as I said, I think it's very important for us to ask for what we want. If we don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. You're your own best cheerleader, and don't forget that. Make it clear what your ambitions are. Don't be afraid to take some risks. I know that a lot of us tend to be very risk averse. but. Don't wait until you're 100% ready for that next job. You know, go for it. You know, try to think a little bit outside of the box. And uh, I am so encouraged by so many of you in this room and the next generation of Asian leaders. I have no doubt that we're going to work together to show that diversity is a competitive advantage, that diversity drives innovation, it drives performance, it drives results, and all of you are going to do it with us. So thank you so much for being with us today. We don't have um, that much to add at all. Ditto, ditto. I, I would just say, um, you know, it, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? Um, okay, what does it even mean to say you failed, right? You learn from it. Um, and we have a very tight definition of failure, by the way, right? Because we have a very straight and narrow objective. It's like, oh my God, I didn't do that. I failed. Nah. So just expand it. Um, to everything that Michael and Ida has just said, but also do some self-reflection about what makes you tick, right? And what makes you happy? It, this is, part of it is life planning. 
um, and knowing that what are you really good at and knowing that and get some feedback on that. And what are the things that you see other people being really good at that you know you could kind of work on and work with your village or however you per, per, you know put your community together to help you do that. And then, you know what, plunge. <laughs> Go for it. But with both feet, four feet. That's what I would say. Super. OK, let me just close. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Look, this has been a, uh, a terrific discussion. And I think one thing that just hopefully is just abundantly clear to everybody here is how committed our panelists are to this cause, to wanting to advance, to wanting to help. They showed up here today because of that. So thank you. We're, we're going to be around uh, during the break a bit, so uh, I think we don't have time here for questions, so we'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have, and thank you all for being here as well.